Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. And today, welcome to the latest edition of AFCA Roundtables. We're really excited to welcome the cast, the creatives, uh, all the folks who are involved in the exciting upcoming A24 film, Zola. I am going to kick things off by introducing you to the AFCA members who are participating in our roundtable today, beginning with our facilitator, Katia Woods in Philadelphia, Reggie Pounder in Chicago, Brandon Collins in New York, Rhonda Rasha Penrise in Atlanta, and Carolyn Hines in Toronto. I'm going to let you guys do what you do so well, and I will see you on the other side. So my question is for Taylor. What was the most challenging part about uh, portraying this role um, besides keeping a straight face when witness to all this madness going on? I like that distinction because the straight face was very challenging. <clears throat> but um, I mean, playing a real person who's a big spirit like Zola is a quite a heavy feat. I wanted to honor her and her experience, which is also extremely traumatic. And, um, and just like, you know, being comfortable in my body and not overthinking it. And Tampa, the atmosphere is a little, it has its unfriendly Confederate flag energy. And um, wanting to do good work for Janixa, for myself, for my co-stars. And, oh, and I also worked at a strip club for four weeks to prep because I didn't want to phone it in or wink at it or look like I, I'm a technically trained dancer, but I didn't want that. So it was like unbecoming and undoing like my training and wanting to honor stripper culture, sex workers, the women that I met in the club. Thank you, great job. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Kathy Woods Cup of Social. My question is for you, you Janica, is when you first saw the thread and, and, and thought about writing this screenplay where you're like, how do we get this from the craziness to like a, a story that, you know, the, that people can follow? Because even with the film, you're like, leave girl leave. what 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 was that process like for you just going from reading the thread and being like how do we make this you know where an audience is comfortable following it without you know feeling like this is just insane you know I didn't think so much of the audience experience because my job first and foremost was to protect Asia to protect Zola and the story that she told and so that, that, was, that was my job, right? Was to take care of her and the narrative that she told and to treat that source material like it was sacred. I'm a theater student. I come from you know, the theater. I went to NYU, I studied theater, directing design, acting for theater. And I approached the text like I would were I to be adapting August Wilson, were I to be adapting Chekhov, Shakespeare, I treated it the same, right? And, and what that meant was I wanted to hold her voice on a pedestal like I would any of those writers that I was taught to hold on a pedestal. Um, so that's really the thing I was, I was out to do. I read the story the day it came out on Twitter. I fell in love with it immediately before it was done, I was like, I need to make this bring to me, me to it, how do we get their stat? Uh, and it took a couple of years to get there. I wasn't the first choice, I wasn't the second choice. Shit, I don't know if I was the third, fourth and fifth, but I was the last choice and here we all are together. Um, I'd never heard a voice like hers. And at that point, it's not like I was getting sent a bunch of work to me. But between 2015 and 2017, by the time I got her film or by the time I got her story, I had had a handful of scripts sent to me. And I just, you know, I, we, we are all in this business. We've all read things. There are a lot of bad scripts. And I still found myself going back to the thing that she wrote, which to me felt like a film. I know sometimes people ask like, well, how do you see a movie here? And I'm like, it read like the outline of a film. There was a very clear first act, second act, third act. I knew who the villain was. I knew who the good guy was. I knew where the heart stood. Um, and there was a very clear journey, right? It's like, I don't wanna be home. Then I go on an adventure and I'm like, please take me home, right? Like that's the movie. And so I, 
I just knew that I was the right person to protect it, or I felt I was the right person to protect it. It's so hard to get the work made. And I was willing to go along on the ride for it, no matter how long it was going to take. I'm, I'm grateful that it didn't take us, I think in total from 2000, from me coming on board to 2017 to now, it's only a few years, even though for Asia, it started in 2015. Um, but I feel like I've, I've now been talking for so long. I have no idea what the question was anymore. So I think I answered it. <laughs> no, I, no, no, you did. You did a yikes, good job. you guys. No, 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 you're, you're fine. And I think you did a really, really good job, especially with the intimate scenes. You could tell it had a woman's touch. So I appreciate oh, it. I know what I was going to say, you know, so she was 19 when she wrote this. And if I had had an ounce of the confidence that she had at 19, who would I have been? Who would I have been then? I feel in some ways, I don't think my mother reared me to be small, but I think the world treated me like I was small and I didn't know how to take space. I didn't know how to be big. And when I read that, I was like, a 19 year old wrote this? Are you kidding me? First of all, the writing is ge genius, brilliant. It is, it is phenomenal. It is funny. It is stressful. It is terrifying. I mean, it is suspenseful and she was processing and exorcising her trauma at 19. Again, like, I, do you know how much therapy I had to go through to get here? Whew. Thank you. Hi, Carolyn Forster, here's what happened at Carolyn Talks. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. And my question is for Asia and when I first read this thread, I read it live as you were like typing it out. I was on the bus on the way home and it was like one of the most surreal experiences I've ever had because literally everyone had their phone out and was watching at the same time. And one of the things about it is that, that you have a very comical way of speaking and getting your thoughts out. But one thing I think the film did is show like the trauma that you would have experienced and like how dangerous and precarious of a situation you were in as a, as a young woman, but also as a young black woman. Could you speak a bit about your experience, about how about how people have received your story and how you've been able to like, I guess you could say process everything that had that happened then and is happening now <laughs> with the film and then everyone getting to see what exactly how it happened. For starters, me writing, especially like my social media presence, me on Twitter, that is how I process, if that makes sense, that's how I process my trauma. I feel like once I write it down and read it and relive it, then I can finally get over it. So um, that's really what I was doing on Twitter in the first place. I wasn't like looking to necessarily tell a story and the humor part of it, that's just me. Like I'm, I'm you know, I heal through humor and I feel like that's how I find other people who relate to me because we all want to laugh like everyone's gonna relate to something that makes them laugh regardless of how traumatic it is you know so um I thought that I painted a clear picture of how traumatic the experience was when I told it on Twitter but to see it with your own two eyes like to see it played out it does just add the the cherry on top I feel like um and to watch it slowly progress, like to reach to the climax of just how, you know, shitty things went. I think that seeing it um, in film helped. It helps other people. Cause I, like I said, I already processed it. I already, I was processing it when I wrote it. So um, yeah, I think, I think it needed that. It needed a, a clear, you know, picture. Um, and so I think that's what the film did. It helps really explain or really show just how traumatic that that experience really was um but yeah I don't know did I answer the question <laughs> yeah, you did a great job <laughs> no, you did. thank you so much for sharing it because I think it it kind of speaks a lot to like situations that women get into and people don't really think until they yeah. see it so I really appreciate you sharing the story then and and now Hi, this is Reggie Ponder, the Real Critic, ninety-one point one FM, Chicago, and this is for for you, Janica. Uh, you you once said that um, the story was all there, that that the story was there, it's it was complete, that there wasn't that much to play with. Come on, stop it. You played with this like it wasn't nothing. <laughs> I wasn't even there, and I know you had fun. So, can you talk about 
the fun you had doing this and the creative license that you took with it, but also tempering it with the gravity of the situation in the moment? I mean, when I say that, it's not to, I'm always going to lead with modesty, one, and it's not to take away from what, what I know my contributions are, but it is to remind journalists uh, and critics, people who write about this movie, to, to credit, I really want to credit Asia, right? And I think it's so important that we credit her. Like, I'm not really worried about my credits. I, I know I know what they are. Go to IMDb, you'll see me there. But I just want to make sure that we're crediting her because the th there's a few reasons for that. One, for whoever's going to come after her, whoever others, you know, the next young person's story that is being mined from the internet, I want them to be credited in the same way. I would like her and this experience to be an example of what, what we should be, we've set the bar, right? So this is the bar. And I think that sometimes, I'm not, I don't think this is happening here, but I, I kind of want to explain why I do that. Uh, some people who have written about the movie, because the source material was found on Twitter, there's mine from Twitter, there is a reductive, there's a reductive nature to how people talk about it, right? Like they're, they're already dismissing it. And so I, I am just trying to reframe that because I respected the text so much. And so I want people to understand that I respected the text. Like that's why we're here. Um, I had a lot of fun making it, obviously. Uh, this is a little bit, th this is this is in the question you're asking, but it's also a little bit in what came up before. Like the movie is really funny, but it's also really painful. The story is really painful. And I think when you exist, when existing, I can only speak to what my own experience is, right? I am a black woman. I am living in a black woman's body. And as I move through the world, I am not considered a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I am often moving through white space and uh, what I need or what I want is often tertiary. And so here was an opportunity to center the world on a young black woman who had agency, a young black woman who is comfortable in her body, comfortable in her sex. Uh, and, and there's so much freedom in that, right? Like, I think one of the more challenging things was, you know, like Carolyn was talking about the, the experience of reading it on Twitter was so electric and so alive. And so there was no way to translate that into the experience of a film because the film is ultimately flat. And I think what was so electric about the Twitter feed was the interactive nature of it, especially if you were reading it in the moment, it has a kind of live theater quality. So how are we gonna get that here? We just weren't. So I just, I just submitted and went, okay, we're not gonna repeat that. That's not gonna happen here, but how do we, how do we find this charge? How do we find that same charge? And so much of that is the humor and the discomfort and being able to exist in both of those comfortably. Well, well, well thank you. Uh, I, I think I could see that you had fun with it. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Reggie. Hey, it's Rhonda. I want to talk to Asia. I want to know, like, what was the process of, you know, people reaching out to you and why you decided to go with the team that ultimately has brought this to the screen? Because I imagine you got lots of offers. Um, so initially, um, I don't want to, like, call anyone out, but initially there <laughs> were a lot of production companies that reached out to me, um, but they were all just, like, a little too antsy for me. It was like a now or never type conversation, um, which just rubbed me the wrong way. Um, Cause it, like I said, it was so much going on. I didn't even really, they didn't give me time to even process or really analyze contracts. I'm like, I'll get back to you next week. And they're like, no way we need to know tonight by noon. Or I'm like, yeah, well, I guess it's a no cause I don't have an answer right now. Um, so there was a lot of that. Um, and then just like slowly trying to build certain relationships. There were a few production companies who actually sent me scripts like for other things that they had going on. And they'd be like, hey, if you could just read over this and put your Zola touch on it, like write it the way that you wrote. And I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> but with free? no check, there was no check. Right, for free, you just want me to write it again in my 
vernacular as they'd say and I'm just like probably not so after a lot of that um it actually slowed down and I calmed down I, I was really patient with myself and with this um just because I I feel like at that point I knew that it the story in itself like took a life of its own so regardless it, I, I felt like it was going to get done so I wasn't in a rush um so a, a little break happened and then a couple directors stepped down. Um, and then when A24 came into the picture um, and they spoke on Janixa, it was just, it, that that was kind of it for me. Uh, Cause our, our very first conversation, I felt like she understood it and she really was here for the right reasons. And so at that point, then I got antsy, like how they were in the beginning. So then I was like, oh yeah, let's do this girl. So when's filming, can I get the schedule? What's happening? Who is it? Um, so that's when that happened. And then, yeah, everything else just kind of, here we are. But yeah, it took, it took, I've been here for like six years now. Yeah, six years. And two of those years, we were kind of all stagnant and just figuring it out. Um, and then here we are. <laughs> well, kudos to you for your patience. I think that's a very valuable lesson for people out there. Yes. Hi everybody, Brandon Collins again from Media Pop Popcorn. Uh, my my question's for Asia as well. Uh, what was something that happened during the epic 48 hour period that didn't make it into the movie, but if there were to be an extended cut that you would include? Um, <laughs> oh, so much, I don't, oh man, I don't know where to start. Like, I feel like all the all the good stuff is there. Anything that didn't make it into the movie is probably too traumatic to have made it into the movie. Um, but all all the blanket incidences are there. For example, there's a scene where, like the bathroom scene, where we go into the bathroom and um, Stephanie's pee is like orange and mine is normal. Okay, so that right there it, it's a blanket scene because so many different type of incidences happened for example when we first get to uh, the hotel the nice one in real life so there are clients coming up and she's like oh like after one client he leaves whatever she's like i'm gonna go get cleaned up i'm like okay cool so then she goes into the bathroom and there's just like lined up on the counter a bunch of douches i had never seen them in real life because i don't i don't Okay, there are a bunch of douches lined up on the counter. And after every single, you know, client leaves, she goes into the bathroom and she douches. And it's like, so it is wild to see. I'm like, I don't know if you're supposed to use 15 of them a day. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think but so. <laughs> I don't think I'm not so a doctor either. though. I don't think so. Um, but yeah, it was like stuff like that. And then I mean, there's a, uh, like I said, everything that didn't make it is just too traumatic. There was a time where um, her, when her boyfriend puts what we're doing out on the internet, he puts it on Facebook. So when her pimp comes back into the room, he decides to like, I don't know, teach him a lesson or flex his muscle. And they, they actually have sex like in, in front of us all. And he's like, you know, putting his foot down, so to speak. And so in real life, they have sex right there in front of all of us. And we just kind of stand there like, this is happening. And then he walks out like it's no big deal. So yeah, anything that's not in the movie is just so, so dark. That's why it's probably not in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it, all the fun stuff is there. So anything else you probably don't want don't to see. Well, thank you very much for sharing your experience and it's a great film. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you. Whew, that's an eye opener. It's hard to follow. We're gonna take it down a little bit more. Yeah, being <laughs> waxed. Well, thanks, Brandon. <laughs> but um, <laughs> blessings to you for, for processing that. That's the best yeah. way that I can put it. My question is for Taylor. Taylor, we've been following your story since Hit the Floor. Uh, and what is it like to like have your moment? Because a lot of us 
he thought you were great. And the first thing I did when I saw the promo for Forzola was say, hey, it's the girl from Hit the Floor, right? And there are going to be a whole bunch of fans who are coming to see you, to see you have your moment. So talk about what that's like to going, you know, to, to having your progression happen and just seeing people cheering for you, the actress. Thank you. That's so nice. Um, well, to be honest, I, tr I'm, I try to not think of it as a moment and I hope that it can, I want to live a really colorful life and I want to expand and be challenged and grow. And um, it's been, I've been on a really long winded journey of discovering myself and uh, noticing like, you know, where my spirit, what I, what my spirit's available to based on what I've healed and blah, blah, blah. And, and so um, I just am like really thankful to be in a position to lend myself in service of the truth. And I, I hope it can continue going. I, I, I hope I don't look at it as a moment because that feels fleeting. And, you know, I'm hoping um, if anything, I can just be a shepherd and example of when you work hard and you have integrity for what it is, what's right for you and what feels good to you and like exiting the party when it's time to go and just, you know, just what resonates with you, what kind of stories do you wanna tell? Whatever that looks like in your life. I just, um, I this whole thing just feels very divine and I just feel really thankful for it. I don't, I don't know what to say. I no, but I just, I think you, I hope you know that a lot of people are rooting for you, and this is it's nice to see good people win, you know, if they say so much. Thank you. All right, so my second question now is for both Janiska and Taylor, and it has to do with the creative process of the film because I think the choices that you both made as director and as actress are super interesting. For Janiska, I wanted to ask you about the sound design of this film. I noticed you don't have a lot of there's no music really you use sounds like the ball bouncing when they turn up at the hotel and then there's like the phone ringing or the, the typing the sound of the typing and that builds a lot of tension without it actually being noticeable so could you just tell us a bit about those kind of choices and for taylor the your body language speaks so much in this film and your eyes are so expressive and the way you just let everyone know what's running through your head without saying a word like you feel the trepidation and the angst and the anxiety and also the anger. So could you just speak a bit about your creative process and pulling that out of yourself and giving voice and I guess and imagery to, to what Zola was experiencing in those moments as well? Taylor, you go first. Oh, I mean, so much of my dialogue is in my head and, you know, Zola's tweets, that's the narrator. So, um, but I, I think I think that I learned in this process how to, I mean, I just, it's, it, the role called for me to be an engaged listener and observer because it's like survival and it's also like, what is going on here? And um, I mean, with Janix's help and vision and just trying to find nuance and subtlety and not have, you know, gestures that weren't necessary and stillness and, the black woman collective sigh, which is just like, you know, like we say so much, like it's just, it's in us, you know, like we, we are, I don't know, we're, we're, we are feelers. We are, you know, we're, we're so connected to spirit, I think. So I just feel like it just was naturally, I just was like reacting to the given circumstances and the, it, and its absurdity. And there's not really much to say, like, I'm going to excuse myself and try to get the hell out of here. And so what is the most, I, I to be like, every line was really about just being really honest, just telling the truth every step, every, yeah, every moment. I think a lot of the silence also is a defense mechanism. Yeah a way to protect yourself, you know, it's like the, the end goal is to get out of here. And so I'm not going to lend myself too much. <laughs> we ain't going I don't need to add a quip here. Cause like, I'm just trying to wrap it up. Like yeah, I'm looking at the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the moment. This is the moment. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the question you asked about, it's funny that you feel there's, there are 44 songs or 46 songs in the movie, actually. Our composer made 46 pieces. But I think it's kind of amazing that you don't exactly feel it because that means it's embedded, right? I think it's like so much in, it's in the wallpapers, so to speak. Uh, the sound design, which I also feel is part of the composition, the piece takes place in 2015. I wanted to treat 2015 like it was a time capsule. Uh, I, I was treating it like we're making a period film. And I, when I am looking back, you know, this is, this is, a, this is Obama, Obama's, Obama's America, right? Um, my memory of that time is, it, it is maybe the, f the first time I'm realizing how tethered we are to our phones and, and what our relationships are to our phones. And I wanted to use these sounds that had become almost Pavlovian as also part of the, a part of the, the, it is the world of the film, but it is also, I, I feel like, um, this is a slight segue, but in one of our earlier screenings of the movie, uh, this, this is not in the film now, but there used to be, there was a digital gesture that was a, a volume button that came, it's, there's a volume button still in the movie, but there's a larger one that used to be in the middle of the frame. And it's kind of like the one that happens on your cell phone, on the older cell phone model. And at our first screening of it, when we used it, half of the audience went to their phones when it started to do that because they thought their phones were making the movie volume go down. And I was like, that's exactly <laughs> what I mean. Like there are these there are these images that have just been embedded, right? Like I hear a Twitter whistle. Well, first I now think about the movie, but before there are these sounds that are just like in our world that have just become a part of nature. And so there were certain um, like pieces that I wanted to feel like extensions of the character. Taylor's character has her own phone ring. Riley's character has her own phone ring. And those sounds are extensions of their personality. They're meant to like telegraph in some way who they are, right? Um, and and the lock screen, it was just like, these are sounds that we've accepted. We haven't really asked any questions about it. We've either accepted or they've taken a hold of us. And so I wanted to include them in this piece because I think that what Asia wrote was also a love letter to the internet. Um, no, I get it totally. When I watched the film, because I've seen it twice now, I kept thinking it does feel like a period film, almost like something from late seventies, early eighties. Thank you. And it has this and it has this really grainy texture to it, which I think is super fascinating for a film made at the time that it was made. So great job to for you technically and for the acting and I'm um, Taylor, like just amazing job all around. I really love the film, honestly. Thank you. So much for saying that. Tell all your friends, Carolyn. I will. <laughs> I, I, this, this question is for Taylor. Taylor, um, you talked about that this was a, a, a challenging role. And so as a father, I'm looking at this and I'm like, uh -uh. Not as a father. Wait, uh -uh. Reggie, real quick, Reggie. Yeah. That's my dad's name. Yeah. Uh, okay. See, see, that's why we we, we good. Uh, so I'm your dad, and I'm like, oh, no, don't do this, girl. <laughs> so I'm I'm thinking it's it's bothering me. You know, I'm like, please don't let that be my daughter out here here like this. And so, so talk about how you were you were reading this script, and was there any trepidation? You were like, oh my goodness, because this this is she. It's funny. Zola says. Um, uh, I only put in the fun parts. Yeah, right. So could, if that wasn't the fun parts, so could you speak to just the, the gravity of the situation and how you approach this whole thing? Well, I, I mean, it's someone's experience and I, I'm an actor, I'm a storyteller. And so Kind of like what I was saying is like, my job is to lie in service of the truth. And, um, but also like the story is, you know, the underlying themes are so much more about, I mean, you know, as uh, are so much more important. I feel like the story is so much more important than the quote unquote negative, you know, like, we're talking 
women's bodies and sex workers and black and white and it's it's satirical it's traumatic it's like also like the systems that are in place that have us do the things that we do to survive right like and um when I approach any material if I'm gonna do it if I have to come from a place of understanding and and non-judgment and I think that people have the right to do respectfully what they feel feels right for them and how they express themselves and so I just think I was like who would I be without my shit you know lend myself in service of the truth movies storytelling art all mediums are I think possibility for the life we want to see or a reflection of of the times and the life that we live and like how did we get here humanity spirit it's it's hard to be a human being you know it's like what are we doing here it's a lot so no. you know the mentality I, I think I've been in a place where it's like hell yeah if someone said I can make five thousand dollars a night I'm going period and that's on Mary had a little lamb <laughs> <laughs> no thank you I, I think both of you guys talk about how you were really trying to respect the material and I really appreciate that thank you so much yeah of course. Thank you for the question. Hey, me again, guys. I just wanted to, um, Daniska and um, the rest of you, to talk about how, because we're in an internet age, Black women are able to break through. Like, I interviewed um, one of the female rappers, and I was like, you know, what's the difference? Why are we hearing so many? And she's like, social media, period. We would never, like, we have a film that not only is about a black woman centering her, but we hear her voice as well. This is not something even as progressives we've come in the past few years, but especially on the big screen, this is just not what we have seen in the past. We haven't, um, and we had films, but we haven't broken through quite this boldly. And I want to like um, kind of get your thoughts about the role the internet has played in especially black women being able to share their truths, their experiences, or I should say our truths and our experiences with no filter. No filter. Well, I mean, uh, you know, we're talking about Zola today because of black Twitter. Black Twitter is very responsible for why this blew up, you know, I mean, Asia is responsible because it was good and black Twitter showed up and went, it's good. Look at this. And so, I mean, I, I don't know that I have a particularly sexy or juicy answer, but why we are all here is because of that, right? Like black Twitter is, I feel solely responsible for why this became a movie because it, they, they, they held it on the pedestal and as with many things, I think when black people think things are cool, other people start being like, is that cool? How do I claim it as me having discovered it? Um, and so black Twitter put the shine on it and you know, white people with money were like, we should make this. And for me, I don't know, the internet has always been um, where I express, I guess, or where I find myself the most comfortable because it's where I can be myself. And that's just because um, especially with Twitter, I feel like I, and I, I think a lot of us on Twitter do this. I found like a sense of community. And I mean, since like early Twitter, um, that's what I was essentially looking for though. Um, people who think like me, who do what I do, sex workers, black women, just somewhere we can all kind of get together and, and exchange energy. So with that being my presence on the internet already, um, it, it just felt right. It's like, this is my community. These are my friends. So me telling the story was me kicking in with my friends. Like I'm just having, you know, normal conversation. And um, yeah, I, I think it plays as like a, a middle man. Like, like Janixa said, when black people do something and it's cool, then everyone else comes along. Like, how can they get in on it? I think that Twitter is a space it's like the middle ground. Like if you, since I don't have the, the contact of the white man and I can't call him and be like, hey girl, I got a movie idea. I'm gonna just tell it on Twitter and then maybe just maybe they'll see it. Um, so that's, I think 
the role that it played. But for me, it's always been a sense of community and where I, where I unleash, you know, it's always been that for me. Yes, and people are up at all times of the night, so. Right, exactly. Someone's awake everywhere, somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Janixa and Taylor, thank you so much for the wonderful work that you put into this film. And Ms. Zola, girl, you amazing. Congratulations to you. We can't wait to see you tell other stories as well. Thanks. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics, we thank you for watching this episode of AFCA Roundtables. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good job, you guys. Thank All you. Right.